So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jonathan Pritchard from uh, Imperial College London, who will be talking about mapping the cosmic dawn with the 21 centimetre line. Fingers crossed. Huzzah. Uh, great. Yes, so uh, thank you very much. Yep, so I'm Jonathan Pritchard from Imperial College. Um, and I want to talk about ways of learning about the cosmic dawn from the 21 centimetre line. Uh, so I'll touch upon work from some of my uh, students, postdocs, who these days do most of the work. Um, and I should thank the ERC, while I still have the chance, for giving me money. Um, so what is the cosmic dawn? So you know, when we talk about cosmology, we have a fairly well-established picture of what the universe looks like from looking at the cosmic microwave background at very early times. Um, we learn about this inflationary spectrum of density fluctuations that over time grow into uh, the sort of galaxies that we see at later times in nice pictures of the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but there's a gap in what we see um, in terms of the evolution from those early primordial fluctuations through into the galaxies. And that's the period of time which I'm most interested in. Thinking about a cosmic dark ages before the first stars and galaxies form. What I like to talk about the cosmic dawn, when the first stars and galaxies began to form and illuminate the universe uh, with the first starlight. And then reionization, when that ionizing light from those galaxies starts to ionize bubbles, which then grow and eventually percolate in a phase transition. Um, and so in this talk, I wanted to say a little bit about the basics of the 21 centimeter line and say something about the current status of some of the observations, um, which are starting to get to quite an interesting period. Um, and then just sort of touch upon two topics which are of interest to me and hopefully to you. Um, looking at reionization as a percolation process, and then thinking a little bit about how we'll use some of these observations, uh, specifically of the power spectrum, to estimate some parameters and some of the challenges that come up in trying to do that. So if you start to think about this period of reionization, we have some constraints. Um, things like the cosmic microwave background, if you look for the optical depth, which is a measure of how many CMB photons get scattered by ionized gas between us and a redshift of 1100. That tells you something about when reionization took place. Um, and you can use it to constrain the kind of the midpoint of when reionization is happening. You can look at things like the Lyman Alpha Forest and to say something about the very end point of reionization, essentially that it's all done by a redshift of 6.5 or so. You can look at things like the kinetic sonia zeldovich effect and get some sense of the duration. But that's really it. And what you'd really like to learn about is a much more complicated structure that looks like uh, this figure up here, where the red is neutral gas, the black is ionized gas, and you have these kind of bubbles that get bigger over time and grow and merge. Um, so you'd like to learn about those kind of structures. You'd like to learn about the sources that are driving it, which we begin to learn about by looking at the faintest galaxies in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, and we'll learn a lot more about with JWST, hopefully in the not too distant future. But really, the sort of the existing observations are not enough to tell us about these kind of structures. And we need something new, which is where the 21 centimeter line comes in. So just to, to show one picture of what we do know about reionization, so this is the kind of plot that people like to make, looking at a function of redshift and a neutral fraction, so the fraction of gas in the universe that's neutral. Then the kind of data that we have are these kind of you know, a hodgepodge of error bars from Lyman alpha emitting galaxies, Lyman break galaxies, all interpreted in the context of model, um, often with quite a lot of systematic errors. It's the CMB. And what you're trying to do is piece together some kind of history here. Um, one would like to know more. So that's really where the 21 centimeter line comes in, and that's where I want to focus the majority of, of my talk. Um, so, you know, you're all smart people, but just to remind you what the 21 centimeter line is. So, we're talking about the hyperfine splitting of the hydrogen ground state. So, you've got a proton spin, an electron spin, and they can be aligned or anti aligned and do these kind of spin flips, absorbing or emitting. Uh, photons with a wavelength of 21 centimeter. Um, and that 21 centimeter, or 
gigahertz redshifts into the radio band, so frequencies somewhere between 50 and 200 megahertz are of interest here. So 200 megahertz is redshift 6, 50 megahertz is redshift of 27 or so, and these correspond to times going back to about 100 million years after the Big Bang. So we're really starting to look back into the very early universe with these observations, or will once they work. Um, and so the kind of picture in cosmology is that you have the cosmic microwave background, which is a radio bright backlight source. Light from that comes through clouds of gas, which absorb or emit 21 centimeters uh, photons, imprinting a signal that redshifts to radio frequencies today. So, you know, if you listen to, I don't know, things like the Today Show on the radio, you're contributing to the noise here, along with John Humphrey. Uh, <laughs> getting in the way of doing science with these kind of observations. And so what we want to do is to measure the signal and learn about, uh, measure the intensity, which you can describe in terms of a brightness temperature, which depends upon properties of the gas. So things like how much of the ga hydrogen gas is neutral, what the density is. There's an important term here, which is the difference between a, a spin temperature and excitation temperature of the gas and the CMB temperature. If this term in brackets is positive, you get emission, signal. If it's negative, you get an absorption, and that tells you that you're looking at cool gas. Um, and there's a lot of physics that goes into setting the spin temperature and excitation uh, temperature. Um, you can interact with CMB photons, and the spin temperature gets dip driven to the CMB temperature, and your signal goes away. You can have collisions between hydrogen atoms. That drives the spin temperature to the gas temperature. And you can have resonance scattering of Lyman alpha photons, which also drives the spin temperature to the gas temperature. And so we're sensitive to things like neutral fraction, density, Lyman alpha flux, and the gas temperature. Those are the kind of things we hope to learn from the 21 centimeter signal. Um, and so just to give an impression of what that looks like, I want to show this video uh, movie, which is about 100 megaparsecs on a side. It'll go from a redshift of 25 and decrease in redshift. Uh, blue is cold gas, hot will be hot gas. And so we start off with very little. Uh, this moves far too quickly. Okay. Um, so the blue gas initially is uh, coupled and cold. We start to get heating, which are these red regions. Um, eventually, as you get lots of X-ray heating from compact objects, the gas all becomes hot. And then you move into this phase where you have ionized bubbles, which are the black gas, just slowly growing. Um, let me run that once more just to show... So this is the kind of thing that one would hope to see if you could make a movie. Um, and ultimately, this is the sort of thing that uh, radio telescopes like the Square Kilometer Array hope to do, to make images as a function of frequency in order to see the evolution of this over time. <coughs> so just to uh, map that out, so this is the kind of signal that we, we expect to see. Um, and this is very much a story. So at early times, you just have density fluctuations uh, before there are any galaxies. Once you start getting galaxies, they produce Lyman alpha photons, uh, which couple the, the spin temperature and the gas temperature, producing this strong absorption signal. That is strongest if you have very little heating. And it, once you start to get heating from X-ray sources, you move from absorption into emission, and around the same time, you'll get reionization, and your signal slowly dies away. Um, so there are two sorts of signal you can look for. This kind of spectral distortion in the same way as sort of measuring the CMB black body or looking at maps. Um, and there are different experiments that are trying to do both of those, from single dipole experiments like EDGES through to things like LOFAR, MWA, HERA, and eventually SKA looking at these maps. And one of the things that's very nice about this uh, field is that there's a systematic path to probing this full range, including putting radio interferometers on the far side of the moon, um, which is everybody's favorite science case. So these are some of the instruments that people are looking at at the moment. So we've got LOFAR in the Netherlands, MWA in uh, the Australia. Uh, there was an experiment paper which is now completed in South Africa um, and is being replaced by HERA, which is a set of 14-meter dishes. Uh, there are some of those out at Lord's Bridge in Cambridge if you want to go see them. And eventually there'll be the SKA. Uh, so all of these are low-frequency radio interferometers. You know, essentially, you take lots of individual dipoles, collect them all up, and use that as your radio telescope. So, you know, this is a, a fun area for me because I've been sort of working in this area pretty much since my PhD and talking about how soon these observations would come along. Um, 
They're not quite there yet, but there is data, so that's exciting. So these are very hard observations to make. So you have these large radio telescopes, which you need to be able to calibrate, um, and you can calibrate them on the sky in the traditional radio astronomy way. There's a new, well, well, it's an old reimagined technique known as redundant calibration, which telescopes like HERA are using. But this is one of the big challenges for getting these instruments to work. The other big one is the radio foregrounds. So you're looking for this fairly faint radio signal from the epoch of reionization, but what you have between you and it are radio emission from galaxies, from our galaxy, all of which are many orders of magnitude brighter than the signal that you're looking for. But happily, there are lots of clever ideas for removing that. Uh, Emma Chapman, who's an RAS fellow, as one of the people who's developed a lot of that for, for LOFAR. Um, and a lot of progress is being made on this, so that finally I can start to show plots like this, which have some data. Um, so this is plotting as a function of redshift, the amplitude of the 21 centimeter power spectrum, and a set of upper limits, which have um, really just since 2014 started to come from the different uh, telescopes. So MWA has some constraints up here, uh, these black ones are from LOFAR. Uh, these other ones are from, uh, mostly from paper. Um, and then two theoretical models. This is the kind of fiducial model that we think about with normal galaxy, uh, star-forming galaxies driving reionization. This is the kind of most extreme plausible model that you can come up with where there was no heat production in the early universe. And so the gas has, has just been cooling ever since the CMB. And that gives you your largest signal. And the take-home point is that these upper limits are starting to make contact with that realm of, of models. Um, there's a sad story that actually this data point has been retracted in the last month or so. Um, these, are, these are hard to get right, and there's a real danger that when you uh, do your analysis that you throw away some of the signal at the same time as removing foregrounds um, and error estimation. And so that was what was going on there. But things are looking good. Um, the limit here is very much systematics. LOFAR certainly has the sensitivity to detect something if they knew how to analyze all of their 1,000 hours or more of data. So that's kind of where we are. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it's a hopeful phase. And so then the question is, as we start to get detections, what are the interesting things that we're, we're going to learn? And so I just want to uh, play about with two, two sort of areas for that, imaging and the power spectrum. So what one would really like to do is to make these kind of time-dependent movies by making three-dimensional maps, both in angle and in frequency. Um, and if you could do that, then, for example, you could image the ionized region around very bright individual sources, so sort of quasars at redshift 7 or 8. Um, you could start to make maps like this with ionized bubbles and use that to tell you know, our friends who work on high-redshift galaxies what kind of environment their galaxies were living in whether they're ionized or neutral regions. Uh, you could build up catalogs of ionized bubble sizes um, and learn something about uh, what's going on during reionization. So you know, looking at these individual bubbles is, is looking at relatively local properties. But you can also look at reionization as a bona fide phase transition. So reionization is a, a percolation process, um, just as you may teach in condensed matter courses. You know, you have bubbles which have some size. They get bigger over time. Eventually, those bubbles start to overlap, and you get clusters which are, are long. And eventually, the length of a connected ionized region becomes essentially infinite. Uh, in a simulation case, it ends up crossing the box from one side to the other. So on the left-hand side, these are four uh, simulations of an reionization. The uh, red is ionized gas, blue is a percolating cluster that maps from one side of the region uh, to the other. And as time goes by, initially, well, this, this comes into existence when the ionized fraction is about 0.1, and then grows and grows until it, it contains essentially all of the ionized gas. And along the way, the neutral regions go from containing all of the gas to being broken up into separated discrete islands. I'll just sort of show a video of that on the right-hand side, where red is again ionized, and eventually you'll see a, a percolating cluster appear in blue. Uh, so getting more and more ionized, and eventually at point one you get this blue cluster which comes into existence, um, which is the percolating cluster uh, 
eventually grows to contain everything. So when you start talking about phase transitions, you want to uh, talk in terms of some sort of an order parameter, which in this case is naturally described as the fraction of uh, gas in a phase contained within that percolating cluster. So if I'm talking about ionized gas, I've got some amount of ionized gas, some fraction of it is in that percolating cluster, um, and that would be my order parameter. And we can look at not only the ionized gas, but also hot or cold gas, or above and below some sort of arbitrary threshold. And so you end up with a picture that looks something like this, where as a function of redshift, you have order parameters for the different phases of the gas. Um, so if I were to look at, say, this cold gas, down here the order parameter is zero, there's no cold gas. Uh, moving backwards in time at some point, I, a, a percolating cluster appears, it got to an order parameter of one where essentially all of the cold gas is connected. And so you can use this as a way of defining different phases of reionization where um, all of the cold gas is one cluster, uh, hot and cold gas are both in these percolating clusters, uh, so intertwined, uh, and so on. And so this is sort of an interesting way of thinking about uh, reionization. The question is how would you actually go away and observe this? Um, and so one way is to think about things known as Minkowski functionals, um, which are a way of describing the topology of gas at high redshift. And the most interesting one is the Euler characteristic, which is a way of describing connectedness. So it's defined in this way. So you have the number of parts, so the amount of stuff, minus the number of cavities. So if I have a shell that has a hole inside of it, which is a cavity, minus the number of tunnels. So this kind of torus-type structure here has a single tunnel running through it. And if I had a figure of eight, I'd have two tunnels. And so this Euler characteristic runs from being more positive if I have more disky like structure to more negative if I have more interconnected torus-like structure. And it turns out that the zero point of this Euler characteristic can be connected to the point at which percolation happens, where you have this sort of different filaments interconnecting with one another. Um, and so you can look at what this will look like in during reionization. And so this is sort of a, a complicated picture where I'm plotting the Euler characteristic uh, as a function of redshift and then as a, a given threshold in brightness temperature. So if I were to look at this dotted line here, for example, I'd be looking at uh, gas above this or gas below this and asking the question, do those live in percolating clusters? Um, and it turns out that as you go from high redshift to low redshift, you start off with a phase where all of the cold gas is connected. Then you end up with both the hot and the cold gas have these percolating clusters. Then the hot gas breaks apart the cold region, so only the hot gas is percolated. Then you start to get ionized bubbles, which are percolated. And then eventually it's only the ionized gas. And this blue region here is where the Euler characteristic is most negative and represents the region where you have the phases both above and below the line uh, in percolation. And this Euler characteristic is potentially something that you can go away and, and measure. Um, people have tried in the CMB, and hopefully we will for 21 centimeter. Um, OK, so that sort of requires imaging. And so there you're talking more about the square kilometer array. For the first generations of instrument, the real thing that you'll look for is the 21 centimeter power spectrum. Um, and so this movie here just sort of shows the kind of thing that we'll be looking for. So here is a function of scale and plotting the, brightness, uh, the power spectrum. Um, and you'll see that as a function of redshift, this will evolve quite a lot. On the left-hand side is just a, a map of the fluctuations in a slightly silly uh, color scheme. So if I let this run, you'll see that this power spectrum, you know, it rises, it falls, it changes in shape. Um, uh, towards the end, as you get ionized regions, it flattens and falls away because there's no neutral hydrogen left. And so in terms of scale, this power spectrum is relatively featureless, but in terms of redshift or frequency, it moves about quite a lot. And so you'd like to use both of those as a handle to uh, understand what's going on in your models. And so as upper limits start to come along, we begin to be able to play the game of parameter estimation, a la the CMB. So you can write down some sort of priors on data, some sort of likelihood, and make predictions for parameter constraints in the form of a posterior, evidence if you want to do model selection, and you, the sort of thing you want to do is to be able to write down models with some set of parameters, which are things like how many ionizing photons are my galaxies producing 
how many galaxies there are, what X-ray production is there, model the power spectrum and other statistics, and then do this kind of Bayesian process to invert it. So in print, you know, it sounds very easy when you say it like that. In practice, this is going to be very difficult for us because we need to do this with numerical simulations, which are very expensive to run individually. Um, you don't want to throw those away entirely because a lot of hard work's gone into them. And so you need to work out how to use them. And so a lot of the effort that's going on at the moment is looking at the, an idea of emulators. So the idea is to take a finite and hopefully small number of evaluations of your complicated numerical models and use those to come up with some uh, approximation scheme with which you can do the Bayesian analysis quickly. Um, and it turns out that this isn't a crazy thing to do because when you do your Monte Carlo and your yeah, Markov chain Monte Carlo, you're often sampling the same point in small regions many, many times where the model isn't changing very much. Um, and so you know, I'll, I'll sort of scoot on. Uh, the kind of thing that we've been doing is looking at using neural networks to uh, piece together uh, the behavior away from uh, some set of training points. You can also use Gaussian processes. Um, this works really well. Um, so, you know, it's the sort of thing where rather than needing millions of points in your MCMC, you can get away with a training set of a thousand or so and recover the kind of parameter constraints that you expect very accurately. So things look fairly good at this. Um, I don't know, I'm sort of running out of time. Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the power spectrum is just one statistic. Um, because the 21 centimeter signal isn't a nice Gaussian random field, you need to use other statistics, but it's not clear which were the best to use. Um, so uh, some of my postdocs, Suman Majumdar, Catherine Watkinson, have been looking at the bispectrum. Um, as opposed to large scale structure, the bispectrum here is relatively large. And one of the interesting things that you might be able to do is to look at kind of trajectories of your models in power spectrum, bispectrum space. So these are different for different models of reionization and uh, hopefully will help to distinguish uh, different things going on. Um, so that's kind of, you know, some of the topics which I'm interested in. You know, the big uh, work at the moment is thinking beyond low-far MWA for SKA. Uh, SKA, the Square Kilometre Array, has been doing a lot of design work over the last year. Um, there'll be dishes in South Africa. I'm mostly interested in this uh, aperture array in Australia uh, for reionization. But as a project, you know, I'm biased, but I think the SKA will be fantastic. We're very lucky in the UK that we have the headquarters at Jodrell Bank. Uh, they're putting up a really nice fancy building there, so you know, go and visit that. Uh, the kind of timeline is an international governmental organization, uh, hopefully coming in uh, soon-ish. Uh, construction 2020 onto about 2026, and then bits of science happening as the construction goes on with full operations about 2028. So, you know, it's still somewhat in the distance, but there's a nice path from where we are now working on LOFAR to SKA, and then an exciting decade and more beyond that. So I will finish on that uh, sort of uplifting note. Um, I think reionization is still pretty interesting. Um, you know, a lot of progress is being made to measure the global reionization history, but you really need to go beyond that to understand the topology and the structures, um, I think, if you want to learn everything that there is to know about the sources. Uh, and the instruments are really starting to get to grips with this. There's data being collected by LOFAR MWA paper, um, they're making progress in understanding the kind of systematics that come along. It's not easy but uh, upper limits are there and they're getting smaller as time goes by. Um, and once we start this to work, imaging is going to be really interesting for learning about things like percolation. Um, the power spectrum has a lot of information that we're just starting to work out how to analyze and connect back to the more sophisticated numerical simulations, which will be important. Um, so I'll finish there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so time for a couple of questions. Claudia. What do you think is the hope to distinguish between warm dark matter, cold dark matter, no dark matter, considering that you need to impose some initial fluctuation to start growing the signal in the matter? Or so, so, huh. so, I mean, when you start talking about the 21 centimeter signal, there's always two directions that people want to go in. 
to learn about the astrophysics or to learn about the cosmology. You know, I got involved because I thought this was going to be the next big CMB and exci really exciting for fundamental physics. Um, as time goes by, I get a little bit more skeptical for that because it turns out that astrophysics is really hard and complicated and messy. Um, so things like warm dark matter versus ordinary dark matter. Um, assuming that you can significantly change the populations of low mass halos and propagate that into the kind of heating or the ionization, then there can be large signals to look for. Um, and so it's certainly not crazy. You need to come up with a way that you're confident that that's different from some sort of other feedback effect acting on the galaxies. And I think that's the sort of the generic challenge for doing cosmology versus astrophysics. It's trying to come up with clean signatures where you're confident that this is what you're seeing. Okay, one more. Yes, right at the back here. Uh, I was interested by the Minkowski functionals for uh, the topology of the bubbles. On, on simulations, that seems okay, but if you start having data where there are literal holes from a mask or the edge of your survey, is there a simple way that you would be able to fix that? Um, simple? Probably not. Is it practical? I think that's a really interesting question. So, I mean, measuring Minkowski functionals on the CMB, um, you know, my understanding is that that's not been the easiest of things to do. Um, there are some advantages here that your signal is not mean zero, um, and so noise and your signal are somewhat separated. Dealing with edge effects isn't something that I thought about. Um, in general, that sort of area is very undeveloped, and you know, people need to sit down to think about that sort of stuff to see how close it is. Good question. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, thank you.